This is a segment from The Annex, an academic sociology-themed podcast. For more, visit us on the web at theannexpodcast.com. Okay, so wait a minute. You, you called Fabio a public sociologist, and I'm curious to hear whether Fabio would describe himself that way, because to me, public sociology means something more specific than just somebody, a sociologist with a relatively large public profile. Like specifically, it means like Burroughs' whole, you know, we're going to engage in praxis type agenda. Ooh, Fabio? Right. So, um, I, you know, I, I respect uh, Professor Borey quite a bit. And in his version of public sociology is certainly tied to a specific normative agenda, mm-hmm. right? You know, he explicitly says, you know, that uh, you have to be critical of society, uh, often coming from a very radical or kind of Marxist perspective. Uh, he makes this very clear in his ASR uh, article, which was a version of his keynote address as ASA president. And, um, you know, while I respect that, and I think that's a valuable thing to have, I don't think that covers all forms of public engagement between scholars and the rest of society. So uh, I would, I, I'm kind of flattered that you called me a public sociologist. That's certainly nice to hear. Um, I don't think maybe I would fit uh, Professor Borway's definition, and that's okay. But I definitely do believe in bringing uh, science to the public, and there's a couple of good reasons for that, which is, uh, that, first of all, the public has paid for our research through, uh, through uh, tax dollars, if you're at a public university, through grants made for research or private donations. Uh, tuition dollars as well go towards academic research. And it would be a very bad thing for us to take all that money and not tell anybody about what we've done. Uh, There are also some other uh, reasons why public sociology would be a good thing. For example, if you happen to do research that has public relevance, this may not apply to, say, people who study poetry or quantum mechanics or something like that. But if you're a sociologist who studies, say, divorce rates and you know something important about divorce, you should probably tell the public about it. Uh, And then also, I think it's good for the health of academia in general to have a constant engagement with the public. Uh, to always balance what we care about within our own tribal disciplines with what may matter to everyday people. And that is certainly a valuable thing to do. So I definitely consider part of my work uh, public sociology, even though it may not be in the definition that Gabriel alluded to. Is that kind of, does that type of philosophy guide the work you're doing at Context right now? Like what's your, what's the agenda with Context uh? Oh, absolutely. The The agenda with context, at least as far as Rashawn and I are doing it, is to make it a bridge between the discipline of sociology and the wider public. So, for example, one thing that we're doing uh, with during our uh, tenure is a new section called Policy Briefs, where we invite one leading scholar to uh, review some area of scholarship or research on a particular issue, and then to offer a for or against that policy. Uh, so, for example, uh, Chris. Uh, so, for example, um, our first one was done by Paula Lance, who is one of the uh, deans at the University of Michigan Ford School of Public Policy, and she wrote about at what age people should be allowed to smoke. Uh, Ted Gerber at the University of Wisconsin wrote about the issue uh, about whether um, giving aid to uh, to uh, Eastern European countries for democratization is a good thing or not. We had a really great feature on FOSTA, which is anti-trafficking uh, legislation, and our author, uh, she argued uh, against it, saying that uh, trafficking laws often conflate kidnapping and human slavery with sex work, and that's a bad conflation to make. And then our upcoming one will be by George Farkas, who is going to write about uh, special education and minorities. So in terms of uh, public sociology being a motivation is definitely a motivation in context. We're asking scholars to say, what's your best stuff? What's an interesting thing? Can you write in a format that other people would care about and that can be transmitted to the public at large? And that is 100% what context is all about. That sounds awesome. Now, uh, kind of the, 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 the issue with context, and this is by no means restricted to you. This has been since day one. You know, mm-hmm. how old is the magazine? About fifteen years old. Yeah, about two thousand one or two thousand two is the first year. That's right. Okay, so so like, it's it's always been pitched as this is going to be our psychology today or something like that. This is going to be our popular crossover magazine, but you know, the circulation is not exactly the Atlantic Monthly. Um, and it's not priced at that price point, and it presumably doesn't have that kind of newsstand circulation. 
So in, in what sense is it um, reaching public crossover? Is it just like there's a, a period where there's no paywall and it gets uh, Twitter traffic during that period? Is it that uh, journalists who might work for the Atlantic Monthly pick up articles and context and kind of rewrite them for public audience? In what way does it actually engage the public? Yeah, so that's a really great point, and you've put your finger on a very important issue. And the issue is this, which is that uh, public outreach doesn't happen by itself. Yeah. It takes a great deal of thinking and strategizing to make it work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so the bad news is historically we've had relatively low circulation numbers, but there's also a lot of good news. Yeah, it, it'll be phenomenal. So we're not quite there yet. We need a little bit of extra help to make that happen. And the way we make that happen is that for 30 days after the release of each issue, all of that issue of context is 100% free. You can download the entire magazine for free. Then after 11 months, then it becomes free forever. That's part one. So we have a lot of time in which you can download it for free. Uh, number two, we have a website where we can continue dialogues or have shorter timely pieces, and that really increases the outreach to a larger audience. Uh, number three, three, we recruit people who can be bridges between academia and the public. So, for example, in our first issue in, um, in the winter, uh, our first two interview subjects were Arlie Hochschild, who's great at communicating with the public, and Melissa Harris-Perry. Then uh, in the spring issue, we interviewed uh, an artist named Ayana Jackson, who was a sociologist as an undergrad, but now making a big splash as a photographer. And also that issue had Tina Cuellar, who is a justice on the California Supreme Court. So he's talking about the uh, challenges that uh, come with being on an appellate court like that. Cornell West was our, our summer uh, interview. And then this coming fall, I'm really pleased to announce that we're going to have two uh, absolutely fabulous interviews. One is with Mario Small, sociologist at Harvard University, who can talk about his book, Someone to Talk to, and also Viet Nguyen, who won the Pulitzer and MacArthur Prizes as a novelist. So in addition to um, making sure things are free for download, we have to have A-plus quality content. Uh, Gabriel, you also mentioned, you know, things like newsstand circulation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an important issue that actually we're working on. Uh, I can't make any promises now, but when you publish with an academic publisher like Sage or Oxford University Press, that is not terribly conducive to newsstand circulation because they don't have all the channels for getting things bundled with distributors and so forth. That's going to take some extra effort and we're working on it and we'll see if we can do something with it. But uh, your, your uh, comment is well taken, and we're, we're working on it. But until that happens, we got fabulous free content. We have a great website. We have a Twitter presence. Uh, Rashawn started an Instagram, so if you want to Instagram us, you can do that as well. Now, do and both of you have to make fish lips or just him? <laughs> just him. Just him. He, he's, much, he's, he's a better-looking man than I am. I'm, you don't want to see me. You don't want to see me. I'm, I'm nasty. You don't have the daily fanny pack shot? Uh, no, oh, my beloved aunt, she gave that to me so many years ago. I missed that fanny pack. But, you know, really uh, maxing out the social media. And then you also spoke about, like, who is the target for this, right? So uh, at, very, for, at the very least, you have to get your own house in order. So we want every person in the sociological profession, whether it be an undergraduate, a grad student, or faculty member, to know this is a magazine for them and about them and presents them in a positive light and brings their best research to the public. But also by getting people like Melissa Harris Perry and Cornell West to do interviews with us, we hope that'll draw attention to the journal, start building the bridges, the policy briefs are getting spoken about, and they're starting to circulate. And these are different strategies to start building those bridges. We'll see in the long run how much it sticks, but you're not going to know unless you try. Well, the leaky uh, paywall sounds like a good policy. Oh, it's a fantastic policy. And, um, you know, see, we're thankful to Sage for making that happen. Uh, I, I have one more question for you, Fabio. Sure. Can you give us some sense of what is the right kind of submission for somebody who is interested in putting their work in context? What, what, what are you looking for in terms of pieces to publish? Yeah. So the first thing to, to do to remember is that we want the opposite of most academic journals. 
You know, you're not here to impress people with your esoteric identification strategy. You're not here to show that you know more Bourdieu than everybody else. You're here to explain in clear and uh, colloquial English. Uh, you have something to say from your research, or maybe you're writing an overview of other research. It has to be something accessible to uh, general educated readers. So I tell people, you know, think of something like the New York Review of Books. Think of The Economist magazine. You know, something that's a little bit more highbrow, more intellectual, but still eminently readable. That's number one thing. Uh, number two, please remember our format. You know, going along with the accessibility, there's also length. We do not do the 10,000, 15,000 word item. Uh, context feature articles tend to be about 3,000 words a pop, and other sections of the magazine are about 750 to 1,500 words a pop. So it's got to be shorter. And number uh, three, remember uh, your presentation of self. That, you know, why should somebody read this? Tell us about how this is your research or your experience, and then learn how to make the segue into scholarly rigor right, to say, you know, this is the topic that I care about, this is why you might find it interesting. Now, in very clear and simple English that your grandmother might explain, might understand, uh, you know, this is why this is um, a valuable piece of knowledge and not just my op-ed editorial uh, writing. So you mentioned the feature versus the other articles. Uh, my understanding is that the features are in some sense peer-reviewed and the others aren't. Could you tell us more about uh, what gets peer-reviewed and what the peer-review process looks like? Oh, okay. That's that's a great question. So uh, Context Magazine has um, something like six or seven different departments. I'll, fi I'll just focus on a couple of them. The core are called feature articles. Those are like 3,000, 3,200, 3,500 words. They're meant to be scholarly, but accessible. Uh, you can talk about data. You're not going to have a whole data section, but you might have a couple sentences or a paragraph talking about where you got your evidence from. Um, and there, that's meant to be um, a representation of a more serious scholarly enterprise that you've completed. Um, those are peer-reviewed in a traditional way. Um, however, we've taken the sociological science approach to uh, peer reviewing, which is basically, um, well, okay, we're not quite at their uh, end of the spectrum, but we're close to it. We do tons of desk rejects. So if we're just not into it, uh, you know, no, no, uh, no harm, no foul. We'll just tell you politely, you know, we're going to move on. We're not going to jerk you around. Uh, there's only one round of peer review, um, and we'll get a couple of external readers to look at it. We bug them very quickly, so hopefully you'll get reviews back in like a month or two months, sometimes even shorter than that. Um, and then Rashad and I make a choice. Either we will accept this conditional on revision or we will reject it. There will be no second or third round R&Rs, nothing crazy like that. And then the uh, most painful part of the process is actually not peer review, is working with Fabio and Rashad. Because <laughs> unlike regular journal editors who will say, here's, you know, reviewer one said X, reviewer two said the opposite of X, you figure it out. We don't do that. We Our attitude is we are editing. The ASA has entrusted us with this uh, publication because they value us and value our opinion. We're not dictators, but we do have an opinion, and we will tell you, like, please fix it this way. And the review process is only complete after you've made your corresponding editor happy. And that means I will go in and I'll rewrite chunks of your article for you if I think that will make it better. So for some authors who are very good public writers, they require a minimal amount of editing. I, I approve it, and it goes to a copy editor. But then there have been some people where I'm just like, well, you're just going to have to switch this around completely, and I've rewritten entire paragraphs for them to show them how to do it. And uh, that's what I think editing should be about. It's like we have a mission. We want it clear, uh, wonderful articles that you could show your mom and dad. You could show your uh, member of Congress or whatever. And that requires a lot of interventionism at the level of writing, and that's like a key difference. For more, visit us on the web, theannexpodcast.com.